One of the most valuable lessons I've learned over the past decade in real estate is how essential it is to learn from the industry professionals. That's why I'm gathering professionals from across the country to share their experiences with you. This is a Gregor Sense podcast where experience and passion come together in the world of real estate. I'm Casey Gregerson, your host, and I'm very excited you're tuning in to today's episode. As always, if you have questions for me or any of our guests, please reach out to me at Casey at GregersonProperties.com. Now let's get started with today's podcast. We're here with Amanda Holbrook. So she is going to be your specialist when it comes to self-directed IRAs and and give us all the knowledge we need to know because it's such a powerful tool. So where do you typically start with somebody who's like completely green and new to this? So where you start with this, it's you don't know what you don't know, Casey. I think that is like half of the conversations that I have on a weekly basis. You know, I've worked with a financial advisor, a, you know, a traditional brokerage house, a, you know, planning firm, and they were never told, oh, I can invest my 401k IRA outside of the stock market and not get taxed. What? You know, that's usually yeah. the first light bulb aha moment. And then after going through the, you know, well, here's what you can do. It's the, why didn't I know about this, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, is typically that conversation, you know, so I appreciate you just hopping on here because that's, it is creating the awareness. I think that is needed, especially at this time in where we're at in the market. I mean, you tell me, because you work with investors day in and day out, you know, and you talk about their retirement accounts too. I just get a bit more technical, you know, what emotion is that evoking right now when you open that statement? Yeah, hundred percent. We just, especially when they don't, well, A, it's like they've, yeah, they've seen the volatility in the stock market have not, yeah, don't speak highly of that at the current moment. Um, but then we start to direct them into, hey, like the opportunity within real estate and have it to be backed by a hard asset that's like, that does appreciate over time, that doesn't have the volatility. Yeah, it's definitely an easier conversation these days than maybe it has been in the past. Yeah, you know, and I mean, I've been you know personally in this industry for a long time, at, you know, as his, all the members of our firm. And it's, you know, kind of starting off with that same starting line is where I'll start for your listeners today is, you know, I get this all the time is, you know, oh, Amanda, I, I logged in, you know, logged into my account and it says self-directed right there on the screen. And it's like, well, that's not truly a self-directed IRA because on those, you know, and I'll leave the big name banks out of it, but you can pick whichever one you want. You know, they will say, hey, log in here and you can pick your stock bonds, mutual funds yourself. And that's not true self-direction. That's just a little sandbox of toys that you get to play with, you know, where a true self-directed platform, everyone, is when you get to invest in what you know, you know, so I've been around since the 70s, nothing brand new. So what else exists out there besides stocks, bonds, mutual funds? And you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, do you want to invest in real estate? Great. Let us show you how. You want to be a private money lender, invest in a fund. Great. Let me show you how. Now, I would say, Casey, like nine out of 10 of our in, our clients are typically in real estate in some way, shape or form, you know, and for those of you that are just getting into this and you're like, well, I've never done real estate before, but man, I've got that old corporate 401k that's sitting there, like not making me happy. You know, <laughs> what's out there for me? You know, and there are very easy ways to like dip your toe into the pool to where you're going from, you know, the stock market, right? You know, goes a little bit like this, you know, with no control, all right? Versus, you know, if you're just even getting into real estate, I mean, look around you, you've got four walls, a ceiling and a floor, that's real estate. What is, <laughs> what is one of the three basic needs of every human on the planet? <gasps> a home, you know? So that's where when you take that just, Oh, that's logical, you know, and you can put that in a tax sheltered account where it's tangible, it's insured, and it provides a consistent, predictable cash flowing income or, you know, cash flow into the retirement account tax free or tax deferred. It's like, well, win, win, win. Like, why don't we do this? You know, and that's where the education and bringing of the message is that you can unlock that old 401k, make it self-directed and put it in a deal. One, two, three. So typically when we're having a conversation with somebody who's interested in using a self-directed IRA and we, we probably get past the kind of the little education piece of, of why it's beneficial and, and all that, like what's the typically step to actually, if somebody's got some funds ready to invest in a self-directed IRA, like what's the next step other than yeah. introducing them to Amanda? 
Yeah, I was going to say the first step, it's like, well, what do I do? What do I do? Hop on my calendar. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> like that's that's it. But literally, guys, it's it's application paperwork. No one wants to hear that. It's a done for you DocuSign. Everyone likes that. So we do the DocuSign. I'll pre-filled out for you. Click to sign. The most laborious thing is a statement and a driver's license. That's all we're going to bug you for. And then we have a whole team. We're headquartered in Albuquerque. Our whole team goes and gets the funds from A to B without you in the middle. And that process happens within two weeks or less. You're ready to do a deal. You know, so that is wow. like, oh my gosh, it has to be more complicated than that. It, it, it's not. Wow. And that that's another big question I had is the timeline from, yeah, once they're ready to pull the tractor, go self-directed IRA, um, have those funds ready. It's literally could be two weeks before they'd be ready to move it and put it to work. Correct. Yeah. And then once the funds are here, you know, I think one of the other common misconceptions is, you know, twofold, you know, once it's here, does it have to sit here for an amount of time? Do you have to have like, you know, 500 K in account to be able to do this? What's the minimums, that kind of stuff. You know, once the account is here, you could do a deal that day. It can, the, the investment can go out. The only requirement we have is a thousand dollars stay in the account. That's it. You know, so okay. if, while that two week period is happening, Casey, you know, is there anything stopping you from identifying a note or a rental property or participating in a fund and getting that paperwork in order with the titling? No, you know, the goal is to make it a domino effect. You know, as far as like the, the minimums, I mean, we do these for kids. I mean, I don't have my filter on today so you can see my, my little ones in the background here, you know, ask me if they have Roth IRAs. They sure do. You know, how did I take 500K and put it in there? No, because you can't. One, you know, two, but you start with a thousand bucks. You know, it doesn't, you know, you know, there's easy ways to build these and there's ways to do it, not just for you, but for your family um, and put it into tangible investments so that you have, you know, one little funny mnemonic device I always use, Casey, is, you know, tax free. You know, I challenge you to say that. Say tax free. Go tax ahead. Tax Everybody free. listen. Yeah, you're smiling, man. And everybody listening that just did that out loud and made yourself look silly, you're smiling too. You know, <laughs> that's Love the whole point. That's right. Okay, so backing up a little bit, because this is a big question I get is like, especially when it comes to real estate. So people think, hey, if I'm investing in real estate, I've got to, it's a bigger barrier to entry. There's like, it's not like I can go put $1,000. I can go put $1,000 into Apple stock, but it's hard for me to put $1,000 into a real estate deal. It's typically... If you're going to fund a deal by yourself, you might be putting in a hundred, five hundred thousand. Or if you're partnering on a deal, different sizes, right? Just talk about the different avenues to actually getting into real estate. Say you've only got, because again, what's the minimum per year you can put into a self-directed IRA? It's like yeah. Right so for this year, yeah, sixty-five hundred. If you're under fifty, seventy-five hundred over. So I mean, the IRS makes it so you can't take that five hundred k and just dump it in an IRA one day. Yep. Yeah. So that's the minimum. So typically, what do you see people building? And, and I, I know there's a couple strategies we can break down here, whether it's like doing a little bit each year and taking a small deal. Um, but how what are some ways people can do it in chunks as well? Sure. So I'll, I'll touch on that. So, you know, breaking it down just super simple is there's pretty much three core ways you can do deal structure. Right. Yeah. You know, so number one would be outright. Hey, I've got 200K saved up. I'm going to do, you know, buy a rental property for 200K. Perfect. You know, you do it a little bit less because you need reserve cushions, but just for example's sake, right? That would be an example of outright. You take down the deal 100% in the name of the retirement account. 100% of the profits come back to the retirement account. 100% tax sheltered, right? Think of it like its own little bubble. It's self-sustaining. Expenses come from and go to. Profits come back. It all stays in the bubble. Now, what if you have, so number two would be partnering. You know, say you had a barrier to entry of 100K for a fund, all right? And you've got husband has 50K in an old 401K over here and wife has 50K in an IRA. Can they do that deal? Sure. Just partner them together. Yeah, just partner them together on the titling. It's the titling's long. I mean, I'll just forewarn you there. <laughs> but, you know, specialized trust company, custodian, FBL, husband's IRA, 50% undivided interest. And then the same thing for the wife. You know, you're not commingling funds. It's just like if you and I partnered on a deal. Like, I know you're super sweet, but are you going to give me more profits than what I put in? Probably not. 
if you guys did see those facial expressions, it was funny. <laughs> That's exactly it. So there's no commingling, you know, there's no breaking of the rules there. The third one is leveraging. Now, leveraging, you know, we all know the acronym OPM, I'm gathering. Yes, other people's money. Other people's money. money. Yeah. yeah. Well, guess what? You know, the IRS made these vehicles that they can actually take on debt or you can put a down payment or even earnest money and borrow the remainder inside of the self-directed 401k is the one I like to see this one in, you know, where if you were say flipping that property or you were renting it out, you know, the profits come right back into the account, a hundred percent tax sheltered. And then you would pay that monthly mortgage payment from that account. Now, the same thing with a flip, you'd pay off your private money lender and, and then all the proceeds would come back 100% tax sheltered, no cap gains. The key is the type of loan. So I want to make sure this is uber clear. All right. The rule with the IRS is that there's no personal guarantee of the debt. IRAs, 401ks cannot guarantee that loan. So what kind of loan is that? It's an asset-based loan. Te the technical term is a non-recourse loan, everyone. You know, so if you had, where do I get those? You know, there's a list of institutions that do them. And it could be your old buddy from college that has a tired 401k from his old employer could be your next non-recourse lender for your deal. You know, so those are like, you know, if breaking it down into like lanes, you know, those are kind of the, the three lanes of creative deal structure. Got it. Okay. So th that's really helpful. So those examples are still bigger amounts, right? So, but you talked about like, what are some scenarios people can kind of relate to and think about? to where maybe they could get to a 50 or $100,000 or say $200,000 investment, but not have to wait putting in 5,700 or 5,800 a year. What do you typical, yeah. typically see? I know a couple of these, but I know there's a, a lot of avenues to where they could, like sure. money that they can move into a self-directed. Yeah, so uh, I'll touch on that twofold. So money they can move into a self-directed, you know, and for any of you guys listening, if you want my little hot sheet of what, my, what funds can be self-directed, you know, we'll put the info in the link here, but, you can, if you have old 401ks, IRAs, Roths, TSPs, for those that served in the military or a branch of the government, 457Bs, deferred comp plans, inherited IRAs are a big one. You know, all of these types of retirement accounts that you've grown to know, you know, can be self-directed, you know, so that's one way to get more, you know, money in the pot to start with. You know, the other one is we touched on contribution limits. And yes, the IRS does limit how much you can take from your pocket and put into the account. But Casey, is there a cap on the earnings of your investment? Nope. Nope. You know, so what are some examples, especially in this arena of low barrier to entry, you know, with high yield results? Um, wholesaling comes yep. to mind. That's a big one is wholesaling. Any type of creative joint ventures, um, creative deal structure financing, tax liens is another great one. You know, that's a beautiful one. Worst case scenario Ooh. in a tax lien, what do you end up with? Yeah, you're, whatever the tax rate was, the little bit. Yeah, of yeah, you'll get a property yeah. <laughs> at the end yeah, of the or day. The, yeah, or the property. Yep. Or the property. That's it. that's exactly it. You know, and the reason I poke, you know, a little bit of fun there is. You guys, the, I just painted a worst case scenario. The worst case scenario in a low barrier to threshold investment would be, oh my gosh, you end up with a property. Mm -hmm. Can you say that about, you know, a random stock portfolio or a mutual fund? Yeah. No, you can't. So that's where it's just drawing, you know, the pros and cons, like apples to oranges comparison. And it's diversification. You know, these are just diversification tools that allow you to not have all of your eggs in one basket in the stock market, you know, that allow you to have, you know, some differentiators inside of your retirement accounts that are tax sheltered. A lot of times we see it outside and that's great, but what if you're closer to retirement? I mean, and you're stuck in the market. And I ask this of clients, you know, like, well, what, especially those that get the aha moment and they're closer to retirement. Why was, why was I never told that I could do this? You know, and it's, I can't answer that question. I'll let you fill in the blank of why you think you weren't told, you know, but getting the message from a professional across the desk or the Zoom, you know, of weather the storm, it's cyclical and you don't have time to weather the storm. That's a problem. 
And although you may, you know, point at a professional across the table, like it's your money. Like you have control of that, whether you think it's like in this untouchable land. And I think that's just a mindset shift, Casey. And I'll ask your opinion on that too, because I know I deal and see that all the time. It's just kind of breaking down that barrier. And it's like, huh, I can control this just like I do my other investment funds in my LLC. Huh. Okay. I can call the shots. That's what self-direction is, guys. You're the boss. <laughs> like you call the yeah. shots. <laughs> you don't have someone yeah. telling you what to do. Yep. Yeah, no, that's really good. So, and then the other thing, just as far as rules on, like there's a lot of times where you can move, if you've been doing, like when you leave a job, right? I'm curious some of the example. I know one example is, hey, if you leave a job and you still, you kept your 401k or whatever retirement, you, that typically is eligible for self-direction. Are there yep. any other examples like that to where you can get these bigger chunks and make them self-directed? Yeah, yeah. So the the qualifying event is always like, hey, I've left a job. I had an old 401k. Can I tell you the average 35 year old has done this between three to five times? If that gives wow. you an idea, like of how wow. much money is out there, you know, that, you know, they just kind of gets left in the dust, you know, or they'll make them a rollover IRA, which means it was a once upon a time 401k. So those are all funds that you can roll over partially or full into a self-directed account. You know, so I will say that's the number one source. And I will tell you if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't tell her how many I have. <laughs> I, got, I don't remember where they were. My record is 17. 17, <laughs> but we, 17 accounts, yeah, wow. that we, we like consolidated into one, you know, but I have a newsflash for you. You're paying fees on those accounts. You know, so it does behoove you to, you know, make sure that you know where those are coming from. You know, so old 401ks, IRAs, 403bs. Um, I have a lot of teachers that have like their state PERS, like their pension plans that can be moved. The qualifying event here, guys, that I'm mentioning is you've either left the job or you've turned 59 and a half. Like if you're a 30 year in corporate guy or gal and you're over 59 and a half and you're still there, even though you're still employed, you can move some of that money, if not all of it. And even if you are still employed and under 59 and a half, I've got a tip. It's something called an in-service rollover. And that's a little trick to the trade. Some plans allow for you an in-service rollover, meaning you can move that big chunk over while still being employed if your plan allows it. You know, it. So that's the key is to ask if it offers an in-service rollover. Now, if you call a customer service and they tell you immediately no, they didn't check. <laughs> All plans are made differently. Yes. Um, but same thing for IRAs, Casey. I mean, if you have a traditional IRA or, you know, something you, you were told is you were Roth in college and it's all just been sitting out there and you put money into it because it's been automated, but you're not really controlling the growth. You know, those are ways to put more, you know, having existing funds to, you know, fill the bucket bigger is what you're yes. saying. Got it. Okay. Because that, that was one I wanted to make sure you highlighted is the people that do have a 401k with their employer, but they've been there for a long time. So it sounds like they just need to talk to their HR, talk to the right person. Maybe don't take the first answer, dig a little <laughs> bit deeper. And, and what's the phrase? What should they ask them again? An they... in-service rollover if in it's your current rollover. employer. And okay. if they say no, just trust but verify, guys. I appreciate your time. Do you mind following up with me in that in writing? It's written in your plan documents. So they should send you a copy of your plan documents. Ooh. Got it. So I love mm -hmm. it. So this really, you've opened the door for everybody, right? So this is people, <laughs> if you've been with your, if you've changed jobs at any point, you can move that. If you've been in a job for a long time, you, there's a chance you still can. Um, and then all these other other scenarios where if they've been contributed into an IRA, all the other different retirement accounts. Sounds like this could apply to anybody really who's been, who has a retirement account and has been probably going for five to 10 years. A lot of people are more than likely going to have some chunk of funds they could contribute. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's also like the two that are missed a lot, um, health savings accounts, you can self direct. Ooh. That's one that's missed a lot. That's like I call it the master of the double dip, meaning the money you put in, you get a tax deduction, but it grows tax free. And we're all going to have health ailments, guys, at some point. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're all we're all going to have to, you know, do a little tune up at some point. Right. You know, so the more we can grow, you know, for health expenses, that's not a bad thing. You know, there's college education savings accounts called a Coverdell or a CISA. 
you know, those can be self-directed too, you know, so lots of good stuff. Let me ask you, Casey, do you work with a lot of, do you have a lot of clients that are entrepreneurs or have like a side hustle LLC in addition yeah. to their W2 job? Yeah. A lot of people like that. Yeah. Like that right there is a big one because if they're in W2 world, you know, I'm no CPA, I'm not a tax a non attorney, blah, 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 you know, all the disclaimers, but like the tax code's not written for that W-2 earner, you know? So if you have that side hustle LLC or you are a full-time entrepreneur, you know, there are things like the Roth Solo K and the SEP IRA that instead of, like you mentioned, the 6,500 you can put away as a person. The IRAs are personal accounts. You have a heartbeat, earned income, social security number. Like that's it. You can go ahead and have an IRA. But if you are a business owner, 6,500 a year is not going to move your tax needle, is it? No, yeah. What if I gave you a vehicle that allows you to do 66K? 66,000. <laughs> How would you do that? Yeah, that's a SEP IRA or a solo 401K. It's based on what your company's doing. You know, so it can be 25% of the net up to that 66,000, you know, the 401k sliced a little bit more, but even if you have a corporate 401k and you're contributing to that, that doesn't stop you from having a solo. This is like the entrepreneur's version of a solo K, okay. Casey. You know, it's the entrepreneur's 401k and I'm talking about, it's literally the triple threat retirement accounts is that Roth solo 401k. What's stopping you from having that and, you know, your employee benefits at your W-2 job? Nothing. You know, yep. if you worked 15 places and they all offered a 401k, don't you get the free money from all of them? Sure. <laughs> if you have your own company, you know, it's not about what you make. It's what you keep. Yeah. Right. You keep. Yep. You know, and that's the other part of the whole self-directed equation, guys. Like, yeah, these are great for growth and diversification. But how about let's keep a little bit more in our pockets? You know, that that's a big part of it, too. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Well, let me, so we'll keep going with it. So if somebody puts in, or I guess a question I get a lot is if like, for example, our, in our real estate fund, if it's a minimum of a hundred thousand dollar investment. And like you said, one example, if they got 50 and they get somebody else with 50, they can partner together and make it work into one IRA. What else though, what would you advise them if say they want to use, they've only got, or they just only want to use 50,000 of self-directed, whether it's that's how much they have, or that's all they want to use. And they want to bring in other investment funds. How would that typically work? Yeah, it partner, would be the same. Yeah, yeah it, it would be partnering the same way. So if you had to do it on the same note or the same uh, like share of the of the deal, you know, it's just that titling is what makes it kosher. So there's no commingling. That's the have your cake and eat it too, Casey. <laughs> so I'm sure I get this a lot, uh, you know, is Amanda, this retirement account stuff's great. And I'm the retirement account lady, right? So they're like, yeah. when I ask them, well, where do you want the profits? You know, they feel obliged to say, well, in my retirement account, of course, you know, you don't have to tell me that we all want cash flow today. So how can you have your cake and eat it, too? It's just partnering those different funds together, you know, oh. is how you're able to do it and how it's done compliantly. It's that undivided interest. It's in the titling. So you're you know? saying that, yeah, so you could put retirement money, easy numbers, 100K investment. I could put 50K from my self-directed IRA. I could put 50,000 of cash. And then mm -hmm. as this fund, say this fund distributes every quarter, that cash flow from the 50,000 of the self-directed IRA, obviously that stays in the self-directed IRA. You don't touch that till retirement. But the other piece, yeah, you would be able to collect on, yeah. right? And yeah. So when they're setting out that quarterly disbursement, instead of sending, you know, one ACH check wire, they're sending half of that amount to the IRA and half to them personally. That's all. Okay. Gotcha. And any other complications, let's say that they want to put it into a, a, a specific deal and invest in with a, because again, one caveat, let me know if I'm wrong here, but if you put it into a self-directed IRA, you need, you can't be buying your own property with it. Or how's that work with as far as like a third party? Yeah. So these are like the cardinal rules. Everybody's like, oh, there's gotta be so many rules. There's really not that many. It's just knowing it's the number one big one is what you're mentioning. So it's called self-dealing. All right. And I love all of you creative minds out here because this is the one, Amanda, let me pick your brain. You know, and yeah. these what is scenarios, this is the number one that comes up yeah. is, you know, if you self-dealing example, Amanda, I have this cash cow of a, you know, a quad, 
you know, four unit property. And it's just, I love it. I would love if I could just take my IRA and just buy it for myself. So it's all tax sheltered. Yep. What do you think? Yeah, your nay? I'm thinking probably nay, unless we get really creative. No, nay. It's always nay. nay. <laughs> Casey. Always nay. <laughs> because you own it personally, right? Okay. You're buying it from yourself. Guys, okay. it's a retirement account. The IRS wants you to benefit it from it when? In retirement, not today. So if you're doing a deal structure with your retirement account where you're benefiting today, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Another okay. example, I get this one too, especially for my creative ones. Well, what about if it's an LLC, Amanda? Because technically that's not me. It's an entity. Yeah. What happens when I, we peel back the layers of that LLC? Who, where's the buck stop? Yeah. If it's you. Individual members. Yeah. That's the, the number one that I hear a lot. You know, so just don't self-deal. And if it's gray, stay away. I mean, you know, <laughs> I can give you all kinds of rhyming <laughs> here. Yeah. Don't mess with the IRS. Just it, keep it clean. Um, okay. number two, so I'll touch on this one because you're working with other investors, right? And yep. we don't just invest for ourselves. We invest for, for family, right? You know, the big picture, you know, so if you remember growing up, like drawing out the family tree, mm -hmm. like think of a physical tree, y'all. So you've yep. got you, your spouse, parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren. If they're in the trunk of the tree, you cannot do business with them with your IRA. So your father couldn't lend to your company from his IRA. You couldn't buy a duplex near the university where your kids go to college and rent it to them. You know, these would all be like prohibited. Okay. Beneficiaries and fiduciaries are in that mix too. You know, but who I didn't list are the branches brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews. What do you think? Yay, nay? Fair game. Yay. Okay. Huh? Yay. Okay. So be nicer to your siblings, y'all. <laughs> uh, okay. So to give some examples of that, if I move my money, into a self-directed IRA, I cannot go buy my own property with it. Um, I've got to go basically invest that with someone else who's not my dad or not my son, but could be my brother Correct. or any other person, essentially. Or, Correct. That's arm's length. Put, at arm's length. Okay. Because say they're a limited partner, say they buy into a fund where they're now a limited partner of that fund, but I guess that's in their self-directed IRA. It's titled that and all the money flows through there. Just better understanding the self deal. So if you're passive, okay. So if you're passive in the fund, okay, and there you're a minority owner, you know, so you're not, okay. you don't own 100. percent You don't over own over 50. percent It's actually the combination of disqualified individuals I just listed is not over 50. percent Could dry area participate? You know, per the rules, yes. So I'll break it down more like it's simple because not everybody here gets like the structure of funds and what mm -hmm. all, you know, a limited a GP would do, you know, so think of it if you're benefiting outside of the retirement account from what your retirement account is doing, are you compensating yourself? Like one I get all the time is, you know, some of my one man armies out there that are like, well, we manage our own properties or we manage our own single family rentals. Can we still manage those? You know, as long as you're not compensating yourself for them, um, yeah, because that's self-directing. You know, you're just making sure that the rent is paid and it's paid right to the retirement account. You know, that the funds are flowing how they should. You're not compensating yourself. Um, same thing for, like, uh, we work with a lot of real estate agents or those that even side hustle and happen to have a license. If they list a property they acquired in their retirement account for sale on an MLS, can they take up commission? Mm, no, they they're, shouldn't. Paying themselves. Okay. they're paying themselves, you know, so those are like examples, you know, the what if scenarios. And if you're not quite sure, you know, if it's in the gray, stay away. Like I said, we're not attorneys. We're a passive custodian is literally our, our like category. You know, if you're unsure, get an attorney or a legal opinion letter. You know, that's always like you're safe, you know, you feel safe. <laughs> you know, get someone to say, yeah, this looks good. And that's why you have a team, right? You're not, you're not out there trying to do this yourself. Yeah. You, know, you have, yeah. you have folks around the table that have that experience and that can point you in the right direction. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So let's continue to play this out. So they put in the hundred thousand dollars into the fund through their self-directed IRA. They put that at play with the fund. The fund has a life of four years They're Every time they take a distribution or get a cash distribution from the fund, those stay in the self-directed IRA. And then after four years, the fund is closed out. All the principal comes back plus their investment. 
right? So then they're kind of back to square one and then they're just, they just keep the money in there, right? And they can decide, okay, what's the next project? Do I want to do more real estate? Do I want to do stocks and bonds? But they kind of just keep it going, right? And, and just yep. growing that over time. Is that typically yep. what you see? Absolutely. You know, so when the funds come back, it's all tax sheltered, right? You know, now what do I want to do next? Do I want to do this again? You know, did you like that? Do you want to be more passive? Do you want to be more active? You know, that's when you make those diversification calls. Okay. And just keep mm -hmm. it going over time. And then, right. So then let's fast forward. So you've started with this 100,000. It's grown over the years. Now we're sitting on, I mean, there's crazy stories of how much that can grow. We, we actually was on a podcast with one guy who started, he just started with a couple minimums of he, I think the initial capital put in was only about 20,000 and he did what you said. He, he wholesaled it a couple times, flipped it. And it's like, it's like $7 million at this point of tax free income. So let's say you did that. You rolled your a hundred thousand and it's 7 million at the end of when can you start to draw on this? And what does that look like once you assume turn for 59? Yeah. Yeah. So 59 and a half, I mean, for that gentleman did it in a Roth and was like, yay, because all that's tax free. You know, so at 59 and a half, go ahead and take that money out. When it's a Roth, you could take all of it out at one time because you're never paying taxes on the distribution. You know, if you're any of these tax deferred funds, you know, the, the traditional 401k, traditional IRAs, you would pay taxes on whatever you take out at that time. You know, the, the Roth, it was only born in 97. The 401k piece, 06. You know, so those those vehicles, I don't even think we've really seen how powerful they can get, but that is a great example. You know, it's when you invest in what you know, your returns will be greater. You know, when you invest in tangible stuff, you know, typically what you can control, you know, are your returns typically greater? Yes. And can you do it in a shorter amount of time? And that's the part I love hearing stories like this, because yes. Leverage, that's why leveraging is such a huge tool here. I mean, why do we leverage outside of our retirement accounts? To get to your cash flow goal sooner, right? Yeah. It, it's the same principles here. It's just, you haven't had the, the floodgates open to realize like, wow, all this creativity I'm doing over here, I can do over here in tax sheltered land too. Huh. You got it. So to highlight Amanda's point of the, the Roth IRA, again, you pay taxes before bringing it into that retirement, right? So you pay taxes at that point, it all grows tax-free. So I'm curious though, um, again, say we're combining funds from multiple retirement accounts. You've got a Roth IRA that's got 50K for easy numbers and you've got your 401K from your other job that's another 50K and you want to put that together in a self-directed. Is that just a counting thing at the very end when you turn 59 or how's that Yeah, because they're, they're separate accounts. So, you know, they're tracked separately. Okay. So you can decide, you know, what which bucket you want to pull from. Obviously, the tax-free I mean, there's some real cool, we won't get into the weeds on this, but there's some really cool conversion strategies you can do within the accounts with switching from one to the other. One I get from like my real, my, my young hot wholesalers, it's like, retirement, you want me to save for what? <laughs> like, yes, pay less taxes now, save for some retirement, do a couple deals a year. You don't even have to put your own money in it. Just do a couple deals. And I mean, you will have millions that you can pull from at that point. And it's the same thing for like kids. Play with the compounding interest calculator. Plug in 40 years. I mean, your kids are millionaires. And if you really want to, you know, play the math game, if you will. But yeah, it's and there's also going back to like, you know, if you're if you're listening and you're younger and you're like retirement is so far off, like where there's a will, there's a way there's a certain um there's certain tax strategies like a 72 T that will allow you to access funds sooner, but it's not stuff that you would typically even hear about because in the stock market world, you know, it doesn't provide that consistent predictable income. So that's not a vehicle we hear about often, but in real estate world, I mean, if you have a rental portfolio or, you know, private lending to commercial funds, oil and gas, et cetera, that, that provide consistent predictable income, could that work? It could. It could work. It does work. I mean, we see it in clients' accounts all the time. Got it. Well, while we're on the topic of real estate, so any other scenarios you think are worth mentioning from, so again, if somebody wants to put some money in and they want to, if they are experienced enough to know how to wholesale, they could wholesale. If they want to fix and flip a property, they could do that. If they want to buy a rental property, they could do that as long as they're not paying themselves it's within the rules, right? If yeah. they want to be more passive, 
They can go invest in a fund. They can go be a private money lender and be the bank for another investor would be rules. Have you seen any other typical ways people have used self-directed funds in real estate? You know, I will say the other the other big one that we didn't touch on and we touched on a little bit is that solo 401k. You know, so it's we all want some cash flow now. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you've got kids young still, et cetera. You know, more cash flow today is, you know, would help. But it's a retirement account. There's one instant gratification tool when you do a solo 401k is you can borrow against it. 50% or 50,000, whichever's first. It's a restriction free loan, guys. So this pertains to if you if you are stuck at an employer and you can't move those funds, check into that. Is if you borrow that money, you're you're borrowing it from yourself. I hate even calling it a loan, Casey, because it's like for savings. So when you pay it back, it goes into the account. Just like when you guys hear how to arbitrage like your home equity lines of credit, this is kind of the same thing, except the interest is going back into your account. You know, so if you're paying yourself back 6%, but you have the opportunity to make 12 over here, hmm, does that make financial sense? Of course. Yep. You know, yep. I think that's one of the, the most underutilized tools because we just hear it for, oh, use it for emergency, duck consolidation, blah, 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 blah. You know, I think that's another big, big, big reason, you know, especially if you're in W2 world, you have that side hustle. You know, the one thing I will say, like, as far as parting words, if you're not quite sure where you're at or how this would work for you or if and when it works, you know, I always offer like hop on my calendar. We'll have a conversation and just see where you're at. You know, it isn't for everybody, but majority it is, you know, it's not a matter of if it makes sense. It's just when you know, when it makes sense. And it's better to know, you know, a couple steps ahead of time. You know, you may be on chapter one and others are on like chapter five, eight, 10. And that's okay. Like don't compare where you're at because those where you're reading their chapter 10 and their great success stories, like, oh my God, how do I get $7 million tax-free in my Roth? Like he started somewhere and it was literally, and you know this in real estate, like a lot of times you are one conversation or one introduction away from having a pivotal shift you know, and we get to see that all the time just due to like the networkings and masterminds and your podcasts i mean it's magical it really is you know so don't be shy take action talk yeah last thing to add to that is add when is the right time for people so if they're thinking about it i think i know your answer but when should they reach out and start to look at moving money into a self-directed ira now of course now or like what sort of like, do they need to have a certain amount? Do they need like, is there any really barrier to this? No, there really, there isn't a barrier. And that's what I wanted to make sure was, you know, if you're listening, that that was made very clear. You don't have to be at like that 500K mark to start. And I hear that a lot, you know, it's like, oh, I thought I needed a lot more to get started. And you don't, you know? So, I mean, even if you've got a couple thousand saved, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, you can't be on my calendar. No, talk about it. Figure out where you're at and what you're looking to do. And then it's reverse engineering the numbers. Nine times out of 10, you know, we find more funds than they knew they had to work with. And through some of the more creative stuff, they're able to do deals sooner and they get results. And that's that's all we can ask for. That's great. And I'm glad you just mentioned that because I think a lot of people too be listening to this thing and, oh, well. I'm not quite sure. I, I heard a lot of this, but I'm not quite sure what money I can move. It sounds like you're open to having a conversation, letting them know, hey, yeah, you've got all these other funds that you could be doing self-directed and you're willing to do that, huh? Sure. Absolutely. Since we're a passive custodian, Casey, we don't recommend or endorse specific investment or investment sponsors. You know, So if they tell us, hey, I want to do this widget or this, it, that's fine. That's great. You know, But we'll show you the how and like where you may have access to funds you didn't even realize. And a lot of times that conversation even goes above and beyond just the retirement accounts, which is great. And, and that's where like having the right team, you know, because there's sometimes I'm going to give you solutions that I will have nothing to do with, but it will put you in a better position. And that's great. Like that is still a win in our book, you know, because when the time comes or if you're using other people's money to scale, like, you know, that that comes back around. And I think that's where like our mentalities match. As far as, you know, it's very, it's very win-win. Like, you know, you help a person today, regardless of the outcome, right? We're always providing education and value. And that's what I meant by, like, we don't have specific, you know, 
specific investments. And that's why, you know, like Casey, we work so well together, you know, because I can bring the how and it drives me nuts because I'm like, I can't show you exactly where to park it. But like, oh, wait, we met through Casey. Casey can show you, <laughs> show you some examples of how that works. That's that's perfect. Um, oh, yeah. Likewise. And again, to our point, when we have conversations about, hey, they're interested in self-directed IRA, where do they start? But they don't know what to do. And, and I'm not the custodian. It's great. Make an introduction to Amanda. Amanda can direct you. And again, whether it's you want to go into real estate or whether you want to stay in stocks or whatever investment you want to make, like you get that freedom. So Yeah. Control, well, thank baby. You a lot, Amanda. This has been really, really helpful. I think I think really, I think you've broken down a lot of the walls and a lot of the things that are maybe holding people back from starting a self-directed, even if it's a small chunk. That's why I highlighted that at the end. I knew, I knew we knew the answer, but I want to make sure people took that takeaway. That there's <laughs> nothing holding you back from now from having tax-free wealth. And getting awesome. it today. All right. Well, appreciate that, Tia. Thank you guys for listening. Appreciate putting this together, Casey. And looking forward to the next time we meet that we've got like three of our own case studies, like success stories we can highlight. How about all you listening, let's help us make that goal happen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Amanda. As you may have learned by tuning into this episode of Gregor Sense, the easiest way to make real estate investing hard is by going at it alone. So as you continue learning and seeking knowledge of the industry, I want to encourage you to build relationships with other professionals who are passionate about real estate. Whether that's an agent, a business owner, or a managing investor like myself, there are pros that want to see you succeed and are willing to help you by sharing their experience. You can always reach me by visiting caseygregerson.com and scheduling a call. I look forward to connecting with you and continuing to share my experience with you here on Gregerson's Mobile. Until next time, I'm Casey Gregerson. Thanks for tuning in.